Uh, it's Phantom Tabletop Gaming. My name is Mason, and today we're going to be doing something a little bit different, something a little bit more intimate. It's just going to be me and you today. We're just going to be chatting. Uh, when I first came onto the channel, we said that my goal was going to be to add some tabletop RPG content to the channel, and we haven't done that yet. We've been focusing on wargaming, which we love, and we're going to continue doing into the future, definitely. That's never going to go away on the channel, but we wanted to bring that tabletop RPG content to the channel. So my group is starting a brand new campaign and a brand new system uh, to all of us, to me and to them. And I thought that this would be a perfect opportunity for me to do a short video series, how I go about learning and getting ready to prep in a system that I have no familiarity with, which is a little bit dishonest, I guess. So we're going to be playing Worlds Without Number, as you might have guessed from the title screen here. But I've played a lot of Stars Without Number, which is written by the same author, Kevin Crawford. The guy's a genius. We love him. Um, and I'm to understand that this system is based heavily on that. And this is just kind of a fantasy version of Stars Without Number, which is a sci-fi game. But I'm going to go through, and today's going to be part one. This is going to be several parts. I don't know how many. Uh, I'm going to keep doing it until I've kind of satisfied my own... Uh, standards to how I would prepare. And uh, today we're just going to be focusing on character related stuff. And when I start reading a, a game and when I start getting ready to prep for a new system, the first thing I really like to do is I like to really read through the character creation and get an idea for what characters can do. Because character creation tells you all kinds of stuff as a DM. It tells you what the characters are capable of. It tells you what kind of characters the game does best. And once you have that information, you can really go about crafting a unique experience for your players. Um, and I'm going to go through and I'm going to kind of give you some examples of what I'm talking about. So uh, we're just going to get started. We're going to dive right in here. Uh, normally I like to try to make good eye contact with the camera. Uh, that's not going to be the case here. I'm going to be reading from the book and uh, I'll kind of pause and turn and look to you and I will give you my thoughts. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's get going here. <clears throat> So we got some beautiful art here on the cover screen. Uh, and you know, right off the bat, as, as I see this art, I think, wow, that's really cool. Uh, I see some kind of castle, uh, but these kind of look like metal beams. So I'm gonna guess that this is one of those fantasy settings where there was like an advanced society way before and that kind of fallen and the feudal system that's popped up afterwards is kind of just the remnants of that. Um, but yeah, I love this artwork. We've got a little guy sitting here. We got some, some birds flying around. Uh, it's really evocative. And Kevin Crawford does a really good job of picking art that matches the tone of what he wants to do. But we're going to just kind of keep scrolling down here. So we've got a standard table of contents. Um, so you can kind of look through here and you can get some ideas about what the system can do. Uh, so we got character creation, the rules of the game, magic. So we know there's going to be magic, the world of ladder earth, uh, creating your campaign, creating adventures, and all that stuff. You can you can read here. You I'm going to respect your intelligence here and uh, see think that you can kind of understand what this all means. But something that's really cool and I'm really looking forward to. We're not going to get into it in this video, but I do want to touch on it. So Kevin Crawford's specialty, what he does best, is he writes these systems that allow GMs to really craft and do their own thing and gives you all kinds of really neat tools to run his games. Um, so we're going to get to that in a later video, but it, it's important to keep in mind that the kind of books that he writes are sandbox campaigns, i.e. I, it's not really, there's not a set story necessarily. There can be, um, but mostly it's going to be driven by player actions and the world is just going to be this kind of thing that's dynamic and changes based on player actions. Um, but the player actions are really going to, and decisions are what really drives Kevin Crawford's worlds uh, as he's written. Obviously, you can make the system do anything you want it to do, uh, just like any other RPG system, but that's a talk for another time. So uh, we're going to go ahead and scroll down. So this right here is going to be uh, kind of like a little quick world primer. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm sure it's wonderfully written and very intriguing. I usually skip these, so I'm going to skip these, and I want to, I want to get to the meat. I want to get to the potatoes here. Um, and I'm sure this is great for setting the tone and all that, but I like to see what I can glean from the tone just based on the rules. So, uh, so this is Heroes of Trial Game. All right, so we're going to come to the what you what do you do in this game section. So if you're a new DM especially, there's a lot of great nuggets you can take from these sections and books that everybody skips over. Um, and, and I literally just skipped a section that would have give, given me information that I could have used, but, you know, uh, 
here we go. So it says here, I just want to read the first paragraph here. Uh, I don't know what it says yet, but let's find out. So it says, the characters in Worlds Without Number are assumed to be budding adventurers, men and women who have particular talents suitable to a life of daring exploration, bloody battles, or ruthless intrigue. They are skilled and capable practitioners of their particular specialties, but all of them are acutely mortal and too ready recourse to their blades is likely to get them killed early in their career. So... That tells us that the baseline for Star or for Worlds Without Number is that the PCs are mortal. They have talents, they're skilled mortals, but it's very possible for them to die. Uh, and that tracks with what I know about Stars Without Number. Uh, you, can, you can die very easily. It, it's very much an OSR game, which is, stands for Old School Renaissance. Uh, I won't get in the weeds with what that means, but basically it harkens back to the old days of role-playing games where uh, things were dangerous and character death was common. That's kind of fallen by the wayside for most of tabletop RPGs in general. Um, but this game definitely has that spirit in it, if it's anything like Stars Without Number. So uh, that paragraph right there kind of tells you as a DM what to expect and what to tell your players about what kind of characters they need to make. So I like to keep that kind of just in the back of my mind as I read through this, is that these are going to be skilled people, not skilled superheroes, right? It's not like 5th edition where, uh, you know, it's basically like an episode of the Avengers or whatever you want to call it. So anyway, we're going to scroll, skip down to the next section. It says, uh, how does this game play? Worlds Without Number is based on an old-school renaissance, that's what I was just talking about, uh, rules chassis, strongly inspired by the classic gaming books of Gary Gygax, Dave Arneson, Tom Moldvay, and Zeb Cook. Uh, the roots of this system date back to the very earliest days of the hobby. There are millions of people worldwide who understand the basic outline of the system, and this enormous well, famil well of familiarity is one of the main reasons it was chosen as the base. Um, so, yeah, that is pretty much exactly what I was talking about. It harkens back to the older days. Uh, and if you don't know who Gary Gygax, Dave Arneson, Tom Moldvay, and Zeb Cook, if you don't know all of those names, um, and you're really in love with tabletop RPGs as a hobby, uh, do yourself a favor, take a little history tour and kind of just go to Wikipedia and read about these guys because they're all fascinating. Uh, at any rate, uh, the system in Worlds Without Number has received years of effective use and playtesting in the form of compatible sci-fi sister game Stars Without Number, and I'm confident that the great majority of readers will find a perfectly solid, playable, effective framework for their sword and sorcery adventures. Even so, I understand that a good many readers will have their own preferences in game systems and may have a different rule system in mind for running their campaigns. Uh, and this is perfectly reasonable because ultimately Worlds Without Number is more about supporting a style of gaming than a particular system. This game is built from the ground up to support the GM in running a sandbox style of campaign, one where the thrust of the action is entirely dependent on the ambitions and goals of the players. The tools in this book are built to support this playstyle no matter what game system is being used. So uh, that's exactly what I was saying earlier. He writes these to build sandbox games. And what he's saying right there is if you want to take the GM part of this book, the prep part of this book, and you want to take the setting from this book, and you want to run it in your favorite system, that it's perfectly capable of doing that. He's designed it to do that. So if you kind of like the tone, and you like the setting, and you like the GM tools, and but you just want to run 5th edition, because that's what all your friends run, you can totally just take this book and do that. Um, which is awesome. I always, I always love that. You always get a lot of mileage out of Kevin Crawford's books because of that uh, thing. So I'm going to go ahead and skip through this, because um, I've gone over some of it. So here we go. Here's character creation, what we're going to actually be talking about today. Um, so I, I, this little part just kind of tells you that it's best to play with more than one player. Uh, you, can, you can do it. Uh, it's generally best to make characters together with other people in your group so as to make sorts everyone's heroes uh, work together. Uh, they don't always have to like each other, but if they can't trust each other to watch their backs, their adventures are apt to end in swift and unhappy ways. Um, so yeah, this is all fairly standard boilerplate tabletop RPG character creation introduction material. Um, so at any rate, we're going to kind of skip past that and let's read a little bit in the what players need to know uh, section. And this is a good section because you can read it and it, once you digest it, when you sit down to make characters as a group, obviously all of your players are not going to sit down and read this. No player is going to read this section. This section is not here for players, even though it says what players need to know. This section is here for you, the Dungeon Master. Uh, it wants you to read this section so that you can tell the players uh, what they need to know. Um, so let's, let's read through it. It says, your character is an adventurer in the ruins of Latter Earth, a world set unfathomably far in the future. Untold eons of human and alien development have come and gone, and you and your companions are natives of a now savage and primitive world built on the grave of the past. So that's exactly what I kind of got from the cover art. So it's really cool to see that uh, already come up. And I'm sure that little blurb that we skipped over probably went over that as well. But uh, at any rate, so let's uh, read the next thing. Magic exists in the form of ancient relics, 
enigmatic powers that respond to the correct rituals and creatures fashioned by inexplicable sciences. Sorcerers cultivate the scraps of understanding that they preserved in order to wield these powers, and the occasional eruptions of ancient twisted magic are a hazard in many places still. Um, so this is an important paragraph. It tells you that magic is a thing. Um, obviously, you already knew that. Uh, it's a fantasy game, but, you know, it's important to note. Um, it also shows you that, like, magic isn't necessarily just magic. It can be science, right? It says there, and creatures fashioned by inexplicable science. Um, so because this is kind of like a fallen earth, a latter earth setting, uh, you can have things that aren't necessarily just magical in it. And I'm assuming that part of the reason that he did that was so that you could pull stuff from stars without number into worlds without number to play with, but it's still cool and it's still interesting. And, uh, it's something to keep in mind as you go about designing your world and designing your setting, designing your sandbox is that you can stick you know, some ancient research labs or something like that in there. It doesn't necessarily have to be just boilerplate fantasy. Um, most nations on latter earth are feudal and monarchic. Uh, that's pretty standard fantasy. Uh, some dynasties are ancient bloodlines of magically blessed nobles, while others are no more than this season's bandit king and his henchmen. So again, this is just kind of introducing you to the potential uh, in the sandbox. Um, technology is primitive with brute force and the occasional windmill or water mill powering the little industry that exists. The natural laws of physics have been so corrupted by prior eons of meddling and the accrued changes known as the legacy that more advanced technology is unreliable at best. This capriciousness has all but extinguished scientific curiosity or technological advancement among the people of latter earth. So uh, that's, a, that's an important thing. If you want to run the setting exactly as it is in the book, uh, there's probably not going to be a lot of scientists. There's not going to be a lot of alchemists or anything like that. Uh, these people don't trust it, and it's unreliable. Ooh, excuse me. So, at any rate, um, uh, this, uh, I think, okay, I love this first line here. In this world, your hero seeks adventure. Whether fighting against the constant peril of monstrous creatures, defending communities from the depredations of their neighbors, delving into the ancient deeps that humanity once occupied, or exploring the trackless wilderness of an outsider-altered latter earth, there is treasure, glory, and terrible death to be found by the brave. So, uh, I want to talk about this first line a little bit. In this world, your hero seeks adventure. And this is an important conversation to have with your players in character creation. So uh, I think everybody that's DM'd any amount of time with any you know large amount of people has had the one guy that wants to make the loner character that just wants to sit in the corner of the bar like Strider from Lord of the Rings and drink his beer and not be bothered. And while that works for Lord of the Rings and it's cool, uh, that can be a little frustrating to roleplay with or DM for, right? Uh, and there's a lot of videos that you can find online by people much smarter than me that kind of go into this issue. But I like to tell my players that, you know, make a character that wants to interact with the world and wants to be part of the group. Uh, at, past that, you can do whatever you want to. As long as those two things are true, it's going to make role-playing and telling the cooperative story that we're all aiming to tell a lot easier. And I love that it's right here in this character creation thing. In this world, your hero seeks adventure. That's a very important line. Um, and, and it kind of goes into it again right here. Your hero must, however, have a purpose. They must have some goal or direction for their ambitions because Worlds Without Number is a sandbox style game where the PCs will be the ones to decide what kind of adventures are sought. If you don't have a goal, you won't be able to contribute to that direction, which is kind of exactly what I was talking about. Um, so at any rate, let's, uh, let's continue going. Um, some more good art. Okay, this screen is great. It's a summary of character creation. So let's just kind of talk through this and then we'll go through read about the classes and then you know anything else that pops up and we'll call it a day so here we go so uh the first thing you're going to do in character creation is roll your six attributes in order or assign them from an array using strength dexterity constitution intelligence wisdom and charisma the standard dungeons and dragons uh skill list or attribute list, rather. Attributes reflect the basic potential of your hero. Roll 3d6 six times and assign them in order or use an array of 14, 12, 11, 10, 9, 7 assigned as you wish. If you randomly roll your scores, you may then pick one attribute to change to a score of 14. So the baseline of this book assumes that you're going to roll randomly in order, uh, which a lot of especially newer gamers uh, see that and immediately go, <gasps> and clutch their pearls, right? Um, 3d6 is obviously nowhere near as strong as Dungeons & Dragons. 4d6 dropped the lowest, or their array that gives you, you know, a 16 or 15. I can't remember. I don't have a note off the top of my head. At any rate, it, it, this game is very similar to Stars Without Number, and in Stars Without Number, you do the same thing. You roll 3d6 six times in order. But the thing about 
these OSR games, and especially Kevin Crawford's work, is that your character's attributes are nowhere near as important as the skills that you choose to give them, and we'll, we'll go over that in a minute. Um, but yeah, so that's the first thing you do. You're going you're gonna to get your attributes, and if you roll them randomly, you get to pick one attribute to change to a score of 14, and a 14 in stars of that number, at least, is a plus one attribute modifier. So uh, you always at least have a modifier in whatever you want to be good at. So because you get to pick one thing, if you really come into character creation wanting to make a bow user, you can always make sure your dexterity is at least a 14, which is nice. So then you mark down your attribute modifiers for each score. When rolling a dice that are affected by an attribute, you don't apply the whole score. Instead, you just apply the attribute modifier. Pretty standard D&D stuff. A score of 3 is a minus 2 modifier. 4 to 7 is a negative 1. 8 to 13 is no modifier. 14 to 17 is plus 1. And 18 is plus 2. So what you can get from this is that most of your attributes, most of your character's attributes, are going to give them a plus zero modifier. They're not going to give them a benefit or a hindrance on any rolls. Uh, if you go off the array, they're going to have one plus one, and they're going to have one minus one, and then a bunch of zeros. And I'm sure if you did the math on rolling 3d6 six times and assigning them, you would probably come up with a similar uh, kind of array. The next thing you do is pick a background. We'll read through those in a minute. Uh, you gain a free skill listed under the background. And which equates to an ordinary professional knowledge of it. So uh, the first thing you do is pick a background, or the next thing you do is pick a background. So this will kind of help your players decide where their characters come from. And I always like it when game systems like have mechanical benefits for narrative elements. So like you pick a background and you get a free skill from it. I love that because it encourages players to think about who was my character before the game started. All right, the next thing you do is decide whether to roll for additional skills or pick them. Uh, if you pick skills, you, you, you can choose two or more skills from the learning table for your background, with the exception of entries that say any skill, which you may not pick. You cannot pick entries from the growth table. If you're not sure what to pick, just take the quick skills listed for your background at level zero. Uh, I'm sure that's all gobbledygook, but I'll show you the, the charts. I'm sure they're the same ones, or similar ones as stars with that number, and we'll kind of go over how they work. Um, so if you choose to roll, you get to roll three times, dividing up your rolls between growth and learning. That's exactly the same. So we'll, we'll go over that in a second. I know how that works already. Uh, the next thing you do is you choose your class from those starting on page 18, representing those talents that you have that are most relevant to your adventurer's lifestyle. Uh, if your hero isn't well described by warrior, expert, or mage, you can choose adventurer and mixed classes. So this is an awesome system that's also in Stars Without Number. So there's going to be baseline three different classes. There's warrior, expert, and mage. Or you can choose adventurer and get partial benefits from two classes. So you could be a partial warrior, partial mage, and you could have some spell casting and also still be pretty good in a fight, uh, or you know any mixture thereof. Uh, the next thing, choose your foci, representing your the side talents or particular specializations of your hero. You can pick one level of a focus of your choice. Characters with the expert class or the partial expert feature of the adventurer class get one level of a non-combat focus for free. In addition to this, they can spend both levels on the same focus, starting with level two in it if they wish. Characters with the warrior class or partial warrior feature of the adventurer class can do the same thing in choosing one level of a combat-related focus. So foci are a lot like feats from uh, Dungeon Dragons fifth edition or third edition or pathfinder or whatever your game of choice is these are the things that are really going to differentiate and specialize your character and i'm very excited to just do a quick read through of them in a minute and we'll go through them and look at them uh, optionally, if your GM is allowing non-human PCs, you can make your character into one such creature by spending a focus pick on the appropriate origin focus. Non-humans are described in the Bestiary chapter, starting on page 280. Note that not all campaigns allow non-human PCs, even if they exist in the campaign world. They may not fit the particular tone of your GM's game. So, uh, when it's saying non-human, it's talking about elves, dwarves, lizard folk, dragon, kin, you know, all that stuff. Uh, they've changed those racial bonuses into taking up a focus, which I think is a pretty elegant way of dealing with it. Uh, number nine is now pick one skill of your choice to reflect your hero's outside interest, natural talents, hobby, expertise, or other personal focus. So this is just a free skill pick independent of your background that you can do whatever you want. Uh, if you've chosen the mage class or chosen to be an adventurer with the partial mage class, you need to pick a tradition for your sorcerer. Uh, these are listed in the magic chapter, charting on page 60. So we'll go over this more in detail in a future video with uh, the magic system and how it works, but just know that there's a lot of different ones that you can do. There's uh, at least listed right here. There's high mage, necromancer, or elementalist. Um, so yeah. And then if you're a full high mage, elementalist, or necromancer, or a partial and two of these, choose four starting spells from your class's first level spell list. Partial mages of these classes can pick only two. Uh, record these on the back of your sheet. And the f number 12 is roll your maximum hit points and add one and add your constitution modifier to a minimum of one hit point. 
The dice, dice, the die you roll depends on the class you chose. Warriors roll 1d6 plus 2. Experts roll 1d6. And mages roll 1d6 minus 1. Uh, adventurers have their own table depending on the partial classes. Um, so, yeah. That is savage and a lot different than modern Dungeons & Dragons games are. Uh, at level 1, you can totally just have one hit point. Which means if somebody breathes on you wrong, you'll die. Um, this is a nice little picture of what the character sheet is. You can print them out in the back of the book. Also, you quick Google search will likely get them for you. Um, and it's a character sheet. I don't really have a lot to say about it. It's pretty standard. It's not bad. It's just standard. Um, everything's clear, laid out well. You've got readied items, foci, skills, that kind of thing. Uh, now, the next thing you do is note down your base attack bonus. Uh, this is just a bonus that you apply to any attack roll that you make. Anybody that's played a game will be familiar. Anybody that's played a older D&D game will be familiar of it. Um, choose your equipment package, so they have packages. You can also roll and buy equipment. Uh, mark down your total hit bonus with your weaponry, so your skill plus your base attack bonus plus your attribute modifiers. Uh, note down your damage, record your armor class, uh, your saving throws, and then lastly wrap up your PC with a name and a goal. Uh, every hero needs to have a goal when they set out adventuring. This goal might change, but your PC should always have some reason to go out and interact with the world before them. Stay-at-home PCs, aloof loners, excessively prudent heroes, and those unwilling to dare greatly for their aims are rarely fun to play. Big facts, Kevin Crawford. Big facts. So, uh, this page is your standard, here's what the attributes do. Uh, strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Uh, these are all fairly self-explanatory. Uh, and also, if you're confused, you can pause the video here and read the descriptions. And then it's just got a nice little table showing the modifier that we went over earlier. And we'll keep going down. These black boxes can be nice if you don't understand part of a section that you go through, but I think that that section is pretty easy, so we're going to skip right through it. So here are the skills. So uh, this is interesting. So it says right here, when a hero attempts to pull off some feat of exceptional expertise, they make a skill check. The player rolls 2d6 and adds their relevant skill level to it and the modifier of the most pertinent odd, uh, attribute score. If they have no relevant skill at all, they subtract one from their roll. So this is not, you don't roll a d20 for skill checks in this game. You still do it for combat, but for skills, you roll 2d6. And this means a couple of things. Uh, number one, your characters are going to be more uh, consistent with how good they are at something. So if you roll 2d6, the target number is usually about seven, uh, and you have a plus one to it, most of the time you should succeed at that task. Uh, and that's a lot different than where, you know, the chaos of a D20 can really kind of torpedo your plan sometimes. You know, you spend all these focus pay or all these feet picks and build your character to be super smooth talker and you roll a natural two on a D20, even though you have a plus 10, a 12, still not very good. So uh, I, I prefer the 2D6 system. So at any rate, let's read skill levels here because I think this, this is important as you're kind of getting ready to guide your players through character creation. So uh, you start off as untrained. If you're untrained, you're not even level zero. You get a minus one to that roll, um, which means you're not going to be likely to succeed at doing something you're not trained in. Level zero is an ordinary competence at the skill as might be had by, any, by a common practitioner. So this is just somebody that does it consistently. They're not particularly good at it. They're not bad at it. They're level zero. Level one skill in a skill is a veteran professional at the skill, one noticeably better than most. So if they have level one in it, they are very good. Number two is one of the best in the city. Number Level three is one of the best in the kingdom. And level four is one of the best in the world, ever able to push the skill to its physical limits. So that's important to keep in mind when you're looking at skill levels. And also when you're making NPCs down the line, this gives you a baseline on how to stat out your NPCs. So let's say your players were meeting the best blacksmith in the city um, to craft a custom set of armor. You already know that he's going to have level two of craft. Uh, and if they went on a quest to find the legendary blacksmith that's the best in the entire world, you know he's going to be level four. So he's going to add four to the rolls. So that this chart is important, and it gives you kind of a baseline, a measuring stick on how to measure the relative skills of NPCs in your worlds, and also kind of where the players stand. And here's an important little bit that I want to kind of highlight here. Uh, and this is something that I do in all my games, but I, I love that it's kind of codified here. Skill checks are only meant for unusual or exceptional challenges to a hero. Tasks that are common to their background never require a skill check. 
So if somebody chooses like survivalist or I don't, we're gonna get into, we're gonna read through the backgrounds really quick in a minute. But uh, let's say their background is you know survivalist and you they're trying to navigate in a regular patch of woods. Don't make them make a roll is what this is saying. They're uh, they're a survivalist. They're good at this. There's no chance for them to fail. And if they did fail, it would just undermine their character. So uh, I love that this is in here, and I think it's something important to take into your games and kind of add your repertoire as a DM. Uh, my mantra with it is, is if there's no interesting consequence to failing, just let it succeed. All right. So this is the skill list. So this can tell you kind of what to expect in the world. Uh, there's administer. Uh, which is basically just keep, I'm not going to go into all of these, I'm just going to kind of pick out the ones that are uh, kind of unique, and we'll read over those, because I think everybody knows what craft is, and everybody's going to know what punch and ride and prey are. But let's let's talk about administer. It's keep an organization running smoothly, scribe things well, plan out logistics, identify incompetent or treacherous workers, analyze record and archives, or otherwise do things that an executive or middle manager would need to do. This is a fun skill. Um, so... I could see if you wanted to run a campaign where the players are like running a thieves guild or they're running some kind of warehouse or they're building their own base, administer is going to be a big part of that campaign and I love that that option's here. Um, and then we have connect, which is also kind of unique to Kevin Crawford's world and it's one of my favorite. This is to find or know people who are useful to your purpose, make friendships or social acquaintances, know who to talk to to get favors or services, and call on to help or resources of organizations you belong to. Connect covers your PC's ability to find people you need, though convincing them to help may require more than this. So connect is an awesome skill. Uh, if your players are like, you know, looking for a black market, you can have them roll connect to see if they know anybody that has an end to the black market. Uh, they then have to go find that person and talk to them, but at least they know them, right? Connect is a great skill. Make sure you utilize it in your games. Everybody's going to know what convinces craft. Uh, exert is kind of just a basic athletics equivalent. So it's, you know, run, swim, climb, jump, labor, that kind of thing. Uh, heal is treating wounds. No is knowledge from, from Dungeons and Dragons. You have lead, which is, you know, inspiring others. Uh, and the rest of these are pretty, you know, just self explanatory, I think. Um, now, skill lists can tell you a lot about systems and they can tell you what to expect. Like uh, the fact that sales here, I'm going to. Un, you can you know, just kind of understand that there are a lot of rules for boats and stuff in the back of the book. Um, survive, trade, work, <clears throat> all this thing. So let's go ahead and go down and read about backgrounds. So here is the background list. So I'm just going to kind of read over these um, and we'll talk about any that are kind of interesting or jump out to me. Um, so there's artisan, barbarian, carter, Courtesan, criminal, hunter, laborer, merchant, noble, nomad, peasant, performer, physician, priest, sailor, scholar, slave, soldier, thug, and wanderer. So that's a pretty extensive list. Uh, it probably doesn't cover everything, and it's probably pretty easy to make your own if you have a player that wants to do something uh, a little bit more specific. And it's kind of, it says up here, it's just a thumbnail description of this kind of life, the kind of life your hero led before the game. Um, so yeah, let's scroll down. So earlier when we were talking about rolling on growth and learning charts, uh, this is kind of what we were talking about. So let's say you picked artisan. You wanted to be some kind of blacksmith. You would come to the artisan background and you get your free skill always. So you're always going to take craft up to zero, which means you don't get a negative from it. You're as competent as a person that regularly does that thing is. So then you can either take the quick skills, which will give you trade zero and connect zero, pick any two skills from the learning chart. So you could go through and say, okay, I'm going to have my craft zero, and then I'm going to take uh, exert and no, because I know a lot about blacksmithing. And that would be your character. Or you could roll on this chart here, uh, and you could get three rolls split as you choose between growth and learning. So you could say, you know what? I want to try to get that plus two physical so I can get my constitution up. You can try to roll a d6 and try to get a two or a three to get plus two physical. Uh, and then after you get that, you can roll twice on the learning chart to get two random skills. Or you could just roll all of them on the growth chart to try to get, you know, all of your stats bonused. Uh, at any rate, it's a really cool system that gives you a lot of freedom as a player and a lot of choice. Uh, I really love the way it works in Stars Without Number, and I'm thrilled to have it back here. Um, so the backgrounds are all pretty... Uh, Similar to that, you know, you get your free skill, then your growth and learning chart. Um, I'm sure you understand by now, so we're going to go on. Some more great art. I love the stylisticness of the art here.
And remember, remind your players as they're looking through these backgrounds that also uh, anything that's common to that any skill check that's common to that profession doesn't require a role. And I think that's uh, just something super important to keep in mind. Next, you choose classes. So let's talk about the expert. So we've got a chart here. So expert is an expert at some useful skill. Thieves, diplomats, healers, scholars, explorers, artisans, and other such heroes should pick the expert class if they wish to focus on developing their special skills and performing tremendous feats of mastery with them. So uh, experts get one, one d6 as a hit dice. They have the three-fourths uh, attack bonus, so they get zero, one, one, two, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then they get focus picks that are pretty standard. So let's talk about their class ability. Once per scene, the expert may re-roll any non-combat skill check as an instant action. So this means uh, once every scene, if they fail at a skill check, they can re-roll it. Skill checks aren't combat checks, but picking locks, you know, talking their way through something, they can always just get a free re-roll of it. Um, so that's awesome. Um, and very powerful and very flavorful for if you want to play somebody that is an excellent, you know, skill monkey, as the old D&D term used to be. Their other class ability is Quick Learner. When you advance a character level, you gain an extra skill point, which may only be spent on gaining or improving non-combat skills or raising attributes. So they get extra skills to kind of reinforce that jack-of-all-trades thing that uh, experts have. They're really skilled at certain things. Uh, the next thing is the mage, and we're not going to be able to read a lot here. They get arcane traditions. We're going to go over in a future video. Uh, they get do magic. That's their class thing. They get a 1d6 minus 1, and uh, they get a kind of a slower focus progression than the other classes. Next is warrior. They get 1d6 plus 2, so they're going to be beefy, chonky boys. Uh, their uh, attack bonus goes up every single level, and they get that extra focus at level 1 just like the expert does. All right. For their class abilities, whenever a warrior inflicts damage with any attack, spell, or special ability, they may add half their character level rounded up to the damage done. So this means they are going to consistently deal more damage than other classes. They are good at killing things. Uh, their other one is Veteran's Luck. Uh, once per scene is an instant action, the warrior may turn a missed attack they have made into a hit. So they can always make sure they hit if they really need to hit. Alternatively, they may turn a successful attack against them into a miss, also as an instant action. This ability is particularly lethal when used with the make a snap attack action. We'll get into that in a future video. There's a lot of different actions you can take in these systems. Um, so that's awesome. So just because of their canny ruggedness and how many fights they've been in, they know how to avoid and, and hit things. They know how to avoid being hit and hitting things back. So uh, this is obviously very powerful if you want to make a martial character. Then the adventurer is a mixture of the classes. So if you chose to be a partial expert, partial warrior, you don't get any of the class abilities, but you get the full, uh, you get the full hit dice progression of a warrior and the full attack bonus progression of a warrior, and you also get the you get three focuses at level one, which is very powerful, and you also get the quick learner ability, which means you get extra skill points for every level you choose, and you kind of get similar bonuses for each of these. So these are, we're going to move into what our focuses are now. So foci, like I said, are kind of like feats. Um, and they, they really let you specialize your character. So let's just read a couple just so you can kind of get an idea for what they do. Um, and I would recommend if you're going to run this, if you're going to DM this, to read through it. I, I know I'm, I certainly am. Uh, but for the sake of brevity in this video, we're just going to pick out a couple and read them. And then we'll, we'll wrap it up for today. So, uh, the first one, let's just read Arms Master here. You have an unusual competence with thrown weapons and melee attacks. This focus's benefits do not apply to unarmed attacks or non-thrown projectile weapons. This focus's bonuses always don't stack with Deadeye or other foci that add a skill level, your, add a skills level to your damage and shock. So, at level 1 with Arms Master, you gain stab as a bonus still is a bonus skill. You can ready a stowed melee or thrown weapon as an instant action, and you may add your stab skill level to melee or thrown weapons damage roll or shock damage. Uh, shock damage is something we'll get into later. Basically, it's just damage that you get even if you miss. So, um, yeah, shock damage can be very reliable. So, uh, first of all, you take Arms Master, you gain Stab, which is the system's equivalent of, you know, just whatever your weapon skill would be, as a bonus skill. Uh, so this is an additional skill that you can potentially get in character creation. Uh, then you can ready a stowed melee or thrown weapon as an instant action, so you don't have to worry about drawing your weapon or having it uh, taken away from you in any kind of way like that. And then you may add your Stab skill level to a melee or thrown weapon's damage roll, so it's going to give you even more damage. So you can really see how level one of this on a warrior would really add up. They would get half their level in damage, and then they'll 
they'll get their stab skill and damage, and they'll just be dealing all the damage. So, uh, and then <clears throat> we'd have to go into what Shock does exactly, so I'm just going to skip that for now. Uh, let's look at Artisan. Uh, you have remarkable gifts as a crafter and can often improvise techniques even in fields unrelated to your usual background. You are able to create mods for equipment even if you are not an expert as per the rules on page 56. Um, so mods are cool in stores without number. They can You get to customize your equipment. It's awesome. We'll definitely get into mods in a later video. Uh, level 1 of Artisan is gain craft as a bonus skill, just like before. Your craft skill is treated as one level higher, up to a maximum of 5 for the purposes of crafting and maintaining goods. Mods you build require one fewer unit of arcane salvage, down to a minimum of 1. Your craft skill is applicable to any normal crafting profession's work, allowing you to fashion their wares without penalty. So this is awesome. It lets you craft things. Um, it mods require fewer units of salvage. So usually, how you have to you have to kind of go on adventures and create collect um, <clears throat> salvage to make mods and craft stuff with. And stars without number. I'm assuming this is the same based on this uh, focus. So this lets you uh, do that with one lower. And also, it, it lets you craft. How much your craft skill is one higher up to a maximum of five. So remember that chart we were looking at earlier. We already know level four is best in the world. So this lets you count as level 5, which means you can craft some really premium stuff. Uh, here's Armored Magic here. You can cast spells or use arts while wearing armor that has an encumbrance value of no more than 2. You can shoot, use a shield while casting, provided that your other hand is empty for gesturing. So if you really wanted to make like a combat mage, you could absolutely do that. Uh, you have Cultured. You gain Connect as a bonus skill. You can fluently speak all common languages of your native region. You can learn a new language with only a week's practice with a native speaker. And once per game day, your polished ways automatically gain a minor favor from an NPC that would not put them to significant expense or risk. So, yeah, you can see how these focuses really help you craft and carve out the character you really want to make and make your own unique character. Um, so... At any rate, that's where we're going to call it for today. So what we've really learned about the system is that PCs are going to be mortals. They're definitely going to be capable of dying, but they're very skilled, and they're going to always be good at what they want to be good at. And I really love that, and it really makes sense for the sandbox style of game that Kevin Crawford likes to write. So this is kind of just the conclusion uh, This is to part one of however many parts it ends up taking. Uh, so we're going to call it there for today. That's character creation. Just a first quick read through. This is by no means a review or an extensive deep dive. This is just kind of my first impressions and what I do when I'm getting ready to run a new system. Um, so I kind of read through character creation to get a baseline of what characters can do. Now we kind of know that. And that helps me as I'm reading the rules later on because I kind of have it in my head of what characters are capable of. Uh, if you like this video and you want to see more like it, <clears throat> feel free to hit the like or subscribe button. Uh, if you want to get in contact with me directly, uh, you can find me on our Discord. There will be a link down in the description below. Uh, if you want to purchase Worlds Without Number, there will be some links down in the description to it. Uh, also, you'll find an affiliate link to our Amazon affiliate link. Uh, if you click that link and go to Amazon and buy anything, uh, we get a cut of that. Uh, it costs you nothing, benefits us greatly. Every dime we get goes directly back into the channel. Um, thank you so much for watching. I loved doing this. I love tabletop RPGs. And if you want to see more or you want to see your favorite system featured, uh, let me know down in the comments or message me on Discord. I'd love to chat with you guys. Have a great day. Phantom Tabletop out.